Hello everybody and welcome to this lecture titled Less is More, Optimized Ripped CLTs, The Future. It was initially presented at the 22nd International Holzbau Forum IHF 2016 in Garmisch-Partenkirchen in December last year. So without further ado, I will get started and I will actually start with a rather bold claim. I think that cross-laminated timber needs to change. I think it needs to be modified and I especially think it needs to be rationalized. Now saying something like that about a material that has perhaps not so handedly but has definitely been a great part in this renaissance or maybe even a small small revolution in timber structures that's been going on for the last 10 years or so um, is quite daring. So in order to clarify I would like to show you a brief history of Crosslam. Um, the current form of crosslam, as we know it today, was basically developed in the early 1990s in Austria and actually also in Germany. Um, its significant production increase came in the early 2000s, so basically at, let's say, the beginning of the new millennia. And if we look at this chart of <coughs> excuse me, worldwide crosslam production, um, we can see that we are currently producing about three quarters of a million cubic meters per year. And a large majority of that comes from Europe. Now, you may remember this building. This is the Murray Grove building in London. It was designed in 2008 and built in 2009. And it was one of the, let's say, milestones of CLT. Uh, why? Because it had shown us we can build tall with timber. And that not only that we can actually do it, but we can do it in a rational and affordable way. So in 2009, it was the Murray Grove with its eight stories. Then two years later, the Swedes followed again with the, their eight stories. Um, two years later, again, there was a series of nine story buildings built in Milan. Now it was that same year we've actually also seen the construction of the 10 story building in Melbourne, Australia, which actually still holds the record for the tallest purely cross land building. Uh, 2015 was the year we've seen the erection of a 14-story building in Bergen, Norway, uh, which is not completely CLD, however, it does have lots of it in, on the inside. Um, just last year, there was a 17-story building finished in Vancouver, Canada, the Brock Commons, which is actually a student dormitory. And next year, we're expecting to see the 24-story Hoho building in Vienna. Now, to be quite honest, I am cheating a little with these last two buildings because they do have concrete lift shafts and staircases and basically their main horizontal load resisting system is concrete, although the rest of the system is more or less completely cross -land. Um It's not only the tall buildings cross -land can be used for, no, it's also the smaller ones, more boutique projects, you know, everything from huge cantilevers to curved beams uh, to upgrades, upgrades on seismically active areas, everything you can wish for possibly. So coming back to my bold claim, uh, why would you want to rationalize crosslam? Well, a metal always has two sides and we also have to look at the other part. Um, and that is the timber stock. Uh, there was a very prominent study made by Jonsen in 2011 and the, the most basic outcomes were that we will have more of the low quality timber in the future, spruce will actually start to run out in a couple of years and we will be using more plantation wood. So there is also a chart here below which is actually the northern hemisphere and it shows individual countries based on their uh, forest coveredness, if I may say so. And you can see here Sweden and Finland are basically number one and number two in uh, the woodland in percentage of land area uh, in Europe and for that matter also worldwide. Uh, however, there is also one smaller green dot here below. This is actually Slovenia. Uh, this is where I, where I come from, but what we've seen in Slovenia for the past two years is actually the largest bark beetle damage. And if I put that into numbers, actually more of more than half of our yearly logging realization was down because of this bark beetle damage for the last two years. It's then also the timber stock in the forests. 
um, currently, at, let's say at least in Germany, there are 70% of softwoods and 30% of hardwoods. However, the situation in the young trees is quite the opposite. There are only 30% of softwoods and 70% of hardwoods. If we look at it from the price perspective, um, this is the price of spruce and pine uh, in the last basically 25 years. And we can see that here in the beginning of the 1990s where Crossland actually came around, the price was about 60 to 70% of today's. Well, one of the things we could perhaps do is use more beech. But um, when I say rationalized, I don't just mean that we should switch the timber species. I think cross lamb is overweight. And I actually think it needs to go on a diet. So what happens if you go on a diet? Well, not, not the upper part, actually uh, quite the opposite happens in that department if you go on a diet, but you can see your ribs. Now the trick question is what happens if cross lamb goes on a diet? Yes, it too actually starts to show ribs. So when we were in this quest of ours for the optimal construction element, we tried to combine the low material consumption of the light timber frame on one hand and the robustness, fire safety, seismic safety, versatility, uh, strength, stiffness, all of the good things of cross lamp on the other hand, without increasing the price. Now, in order to do that, we had to, first of all, keep the production cost the same, and second, use the same materials. Basic, simple lamellas. Because to be honest, putting together a deck and a rib together is nothing completely revolutionary. It's been done before. But in this case shown here, you have to make the cross lamp plate, then you have to make the rib, which is usually glue lamp or LVL. These are not made in the same factory. They have to be brought together. Uh, you need transportation, you need labor and so on. And altogether, this is not the most affordable solution. Uh, it is, however, suitable for larger spans from 8, 10, 12, even more meters. However, in our case, we were looking more to the spans that currently Crossland is covering rather efficiently, let's say up to six meters or so, maybe try to push it a little further. So we had to develop basically a one step production procedure, which meant we had to arrange the order, the pattern of lamellas in the outermost layer in a specific way, and then introduce vertical and side pressing to allow this very stable, robust and strong joint between the lamellas that are either vertically placed or horizontally placed, so either as ribs or as flat wise lamellas. Second of all, we wanted to use the standard lamellas as input material. Now, the problem is that the standard lamellas do not necessarily come completely straight. And if you want to use them as ribs, you may end up with problems if you just want to glue them straight on a regular CLT deck. So, but if you employ side pressure, then you can actually straighten these lamellas up and end with this with very uh, stable and straight structure. Or you can actually turn the whole thing upside down. So instead of having the ribs on the bottom side, you can turn it around, add layers of soft insulation, bampers, then some harder gypsum fiberboard, uh, again a layer of insulation and the final screed, and you end up with a very high fire resistant and uh, an element with great acoustical properties, plus having the benefit of the visual, or let's say the exposed massive timber on the bottom side. And then it was time to put our money where our mouth was. So we devised this so-called testing matrix with uh, different specimens of different cross section, different spans. They were both bending tests, uh, so they would act as plates or as wall elements to be later tested for buckling. Altogether, it was over 40 specimens. However, of course, if you want to have the specimens, you also have to make them and then you need a production line. We were lucky enough to have the company Ledinek on board with us with their uh, cross press or X press, however you want to call it, which is actually a modular press system. 
and it, it already has this side pressing incorporated. It actually also has the longitudinal pressing. It's really a uh, nice press system. It's both mechanical and pneumatical, so it's not even hydraulical, it's pneumatic. And we were even more fortunate that they actually had one segment of this modular system in their production hall. And they were kind enough to modify it for us. So uh, uh, instead of being capable of making two meter wide and four meter long specimens, uh, it was narrowed down a little, but it was also accommodated for our specific element types. So you can see here the individual pneumatic ta tanks, which can be fired uh, independently of one another. And this was the whole thing that was powering the press. One very simple compressor. This one was capable of going up to 21 bar, but actually we only needed like 10 to 12 bar. And those 10, 12 bars gave us over 600 tons of overall pressure. So that's quite um, amazing. Um, Stora Enso was kind enough to provide the lamellas. Uh, C24 was the demanded grade. However, there is also uh, always a variation of properties uh, within uh, individual timber grades. So we basically reclassified or resorted all of the lamellas visually, uh, mechanically. So from moisture content to all the necessary data uh, needed for the dynamic modulus of elasticity um, calculation. We graded them into three groups. So from the, stiff the stiffest ones to the most flexible ones, and the ones in between, and we try to spread these lamellas evenly across all the specimens. So we would not end up with the stiffest specimens and then the, the, the most flexible specimens, but we try to, to have the specimens as equal as possible, so with as equal as possible properties. Uh, gluing specimens together in mid-spring, which was rather cold at that time, was quite a challenge, especially in a dirty production hall, first of all, because we had to make sure that the temperature and moisture were at least at the minimum demanded of, uh, of the glue producers' demands. And uh, all the lamellas were also replaned before they went into the gluing process because it was a rather dirty environment. So what was not planed by machine was done by hand. And you can actually see there was quite a difference before and after. So all of the welding dust caused lots of dirt. Um, we did, however, get successfully rid of all that. And even later on with testing, we had no failure of the glue lines whatsoever. So we did a good job. And um, these are, were our little packages. So you can see the dummy elements in between the ribs, uh, which uh, were planed down to the exact height. So we had an even pressure, an even vertical pressure along the whole width of the elements and of course we also had side pressure so uh, we were using the polyurethane adhesive which was applied m with uh, a specific applicator on all the necessary sides and then these little bundles went into our press so you can here see the, the vertical pressure being applied and also the side pressure all coming from these pneumatic tanks. Um, and then the specimens started coming out one by one in different shapes, sizes, lengths. Uh, all of the 40 and even more uh, specimens were produced within a couple of weeks. And here you can see actually the, the glue line. So this is where the rib is actually uh, glued within the structure of the uh, massive crossland plate. Um, so we also did a couple of comparative elements where we glued the ribs straight on to the main cross lamp deck. Um, it was quite challenging to do because uh, in this case we actually had to make a proper supporting structure uh, for the ribs uh, in order not to have any uh, stability problems when pressing them on. There was no side pressure, only vertical pressure, so the ribs could have easily buckled if not secured properly. Um, we also made some specimens using beech for the ribbed lamellas, um, as you can see in this figure here. And then we started with experimental testing. We were using EN408 and a typical four-point bending test. Uh, of course, all the specimens were uh, not only equipped with uh, LVDTs, but also with strain gauges. We also measured the vibration properties so we could calculate the vibration modes of individual plates. 
So what happened was that we have observed very, uh, very distinct failure modes at testing. So very distinct shear, very distinct bending, but uh, even more beneficial for us was the fact that we had never had complete and abrupt failure of the, com of the whole specimen. So it was always gradual, basically a gradual accumulation of damage. It was always one rib that failed first, then basically a load redistribution occurred to the other ribs, then the second rib failed and so on, until the final and complete failure of the specimen. But it was never in one go. Which is great because you literally have an almost ductile response of the specimen, which I'll show you on a little later. Um, coming to the actual numerical results, these are this is the response of the strain gauges. Now we've placed strain gauges both in the lines of the ribs and in between them because we wanted to see if there would be any shear leg, which is quite distinct and quite typical for uh, these ribbed type elements or for uh, T-shaped decks. Um, there was definitely a difference in the strain, in different strain gauges, however it was not correlated to the position of the strain gauge being either above the rib or in the field between the ribs. Namely, there was no distinct shear leg. Uh, the, the difference in strain was more due to the difference in stiffness of individual ribs. And we were really happy to see that because this means that we're basically using a, the complete cross-section. We don't have a, any reduction in the compression plate which can in, let's say, wider flanges be even up to 20 or more percent. So this altogether makes for a very effective uh, bending element. Um, coming now to the low displacement curves, this is what I was talking about. These zigzag, zigzag curves actually show how the load redistribution was going on. So basically, if we, for example, focus on the specimen 6, to be the light blue curve, you can here see the first failure of the first rib at about 170 kilonewtons. Then this one failed, the load fell a little, but then the redistribution occurred, the load started climbing on again, reached 200 kilonewtons, then the second rib failed, there was again declination in load, back to about 170 again or so, and then the third rib was the one taking the load until the final failure at about 180, 190 kilonewtons. So this can almost be plotted as a ductile response. It was the same case for the longer spans. Before I was showing the 2-meter spans, this was for the 4-meter spans. Again, the zigzag pattern, the ones with the uh, wider, uh, shorter ribs. As for the case with the narrower and taller ribs, we can basically talk about a almost ductile post-critical behavior. Now, coming to the wall elements, uh, these were 2.95 meters high and 1.25 meters wide, and they had two ribs. Their cross-section was 4 uh, against 15 centimeters, and they were spaced at 62.5 centimeters. So basically, this is the, um, the standard spacing, which allows for uh, standard cladding later on, uh, if you're using the whole thing for uh, the facade elements. So only the plate was supported, not the ribs. This has to be specified. The compression plate was six centimeters thick. And if we look at the damage of the wall in the final state, um, you can see that the ribs were completely uh, stripped away from the compression element. However, there was no failure of the glue line. Actually, this was all timber failure. But if we look at the numbers, at this stage, we have had actually 1.1 mega newtons of force on top of this uh, very slender wall element. Uh, this ribbed element actually has 30% less material than a standard 10 centimeter CLT plate. And it can withstand close to 100 tons per length meter. If we take a look at the deflection measurements, we can see that at maximum force, we had a little less than 6 millimeters of vertical deflection, although we did have around 18 millimeters of horizontal deflection at mid-height. Now, what was rather specific about this element was that we were basically introducing an eccentric load from the very beginning and then consequently also a bending moment. 
This did, however, result in a very controlled behavior without any sudden buckling. Um, so this was also a little bit of a surprise. And in general, the, the load resistance of this wall element was quite astonishing, especially considering the amount of material that's actually built within, uh, within it. So coming to the comparisons of the cross rib plate elements, as we call them, to conventional CLT. Uh, these comparisons were done numerically, and we've compared the ribbed elements against standard cross limb elements. Uh, as a benchmark, we took Store Insus plates. Uh, so if I just explain the, the, the markings here a little, let's say, for example, the, the last one, XR lamb, and then with the numbers below, these numbers actually mean 120 means that the compression plate has 120 millimeters of thickness. It's a three layer plate. The dimension of the ribs is 40 to 205, which means 40 millimeter wide and 205 millimeter high ribs. And they are spaced at 140 millimeters center to center. Now, looking at the chart on the right, we can see that we can actually save 50% of timber for roof plates, where the governing criteria was the displacement. For floor plates, where the vibration is the governing uh, criteria, we can save up to 40% of timber compared to standard CLT. Coming to wall elements, if we compare uh, light timber frame to conventional cross lamb and then to ripped cross lamb, we can see if um, CLT is the benchmark for the timber consumption, so at 100%, the light timber frame only uses 30% of that material, whereas the ripped uh, cross lamb elements use 70% of that. Although when we then go to the load bearing capacity, when the utilization of the light timber frame is already at 100%, so basically the wall reaches its maximum, the standard CLT is at 53% and the ribbed plate is only 35%. Even more distinct are the differences with uh, at a, a fire load case. So basically when the light timber frame is already burned through, the CLT is at 55% and the ribbed uh, cross lamb is at only 10% because that six centimeter compression plate offers lots of fire resistance uh, and behind there, there are still the ribs that offer the buckling resistance. Coming to conclusions, so overall we've managed to um, keep all the benefits of conventional cross lamb. Um, however, with the dedicated production line, we can keep the production cost of the ribbed cross lamb plates at the same level as standard cross lamb. On the other hand, we can save up to 40% of timber compared to standard CLT for floor plates and up to 50% of timber for roof plates. Uh, we can save at least 30% of timber for wall elements, uh, which also have a great potential for, for multi-story buildings. And in general, the outer envelope building costs can be reduced due to the substructure already being a part of the wall element. So basically the ribs, we have at 62.5 spacing can then accommodate the cladding. There is no need for the substructure for the facade. And with this, I shall conclude. Um, the research that was performed or shown in this, uh, in this presentation is part of the HCLTP, the Hybrid Cross Laminated Timber Plates Research Project funded by the Wood Wisdom Network. The partners on the project include the University of Ljubljana, Faculty of Civil and Geodetic Engineering, CBD Contemporary Building Design, ITI from the Technical University of Vienna, Stora Einstor, Czernyushek, MPA and Ledinek. So thank you for your attention. Uh, if you would like to know more, you can always visit our webpage, which is www.hcltp.com, where you will also be able to find the final re reports of the project, uh, hopefully available in already in March 2017. Thank you and goodbye.